So just to briefly introduce Richard Swinburne, um, Richard Swinburne is Emeritus... I've, I've been at this conference. <laughs> <laughs> for those who have joined for today, uh, Richard is Emeritus Professor um, of the Christian Religion here at Oxford. Um, I'm sure he needs no further introduction because of his uh, reputation and uh, all the work he's done, but I'll hand over to him um, so that he can talk about uh, what he's talking about today. And I believe he's talking about uh, Tim McGrew and Lydia McGrew's chapter in the Blackwell to Natural... Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, and Richard will just offer some comments on that, uh, and then we'll have some discussion, so yeah. thanks. Could you put the theorem on, on the board again? Yes. Yeah. Uh, with R in it, just the simple version of it. Um, yes, uh, I don't know how many of those present uh, are at all familiar with uh, any of my writing, or Tim and Lydia McGrew's writing on this. Um, uh, when I was asked to contribute to this, I was sort of assuming that uh, everyone here would at any rate have heard the presentation which I gave at the conference itself, although that didn't involve any Bayesian symbols. Um, I don't want to take up a great deal of time in this because other people will want to talk, but um, my approach to this matter, uh, which is contained in the appendix to my book, The Resurrection of God Incarnate, there's a formal appendix in which the main argument is then put in Bayesian terms. Um, uh, uh, the sort of arguments for the particular values we're concerned with uh, um, are given in the main book, but I don't quantify it then, and then I suggest, well, I. I've said that a certain thing would be very probable on certain evidence, then I'm going to say, well, of course, you can't give an exact numerical value to very probable, but let's call it 0.9. And then I would uh, argue that something else is very improbable, and then I would say, well, if it's very improbable, let's call it 0.1, or if it's very, very improbable, I just call it 0.01, and so on. And if you give, uh, put certain numbers in, then you get certain a number out. And um, my approach consisted very much on uh, getting a reasonably high value for the prior probability of something like the resurrection um, uh, happening. Now, the prior probability, unfortunately we haven't got a black whiteboard here, but at any rate, uh, there are the prior probability, this is the prior probability of background evidence, but there are two kinds of background evidence. Um, first, you want evidence for the existence of God, that is, the evidence of natural theology. And that's also something I've written about at great length, but of course it's not just me, it's everybody who's written about this. And some people think on the evidence of natural theology this is very high, and some people think it's very low. Um, I give, I give a probabilistic argument suggesting that it's significantly more probable than not that there is a God on the evidence of natural theology, that is the evidence that there's a world, that it's governed almost entirely by uh, simple, comprehensible laws, um, that these laws are such as lead to the evolution of human beings, that human beings are conscious, and one or two general and rather obvious facts about the world. And uh, I don't even want, in my argument for the resurrection, to uh, assume that the probability is uh, uh, even as high as I have argued elsewhere. So let's say the probability of uh, there being a god uh, on the evidence of natural theology is a half. Uh, but by there being a god, of course, I mean a particular kind of god, and I've argued that the simplest explanation of the phenomena is that um, uh, there is a personal being who is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free, and so perfectly good. Now, uh, uh, that's stage one. And then I argue that given that there is such a being, and given that he created humans, there are three reasons, at least, why he should become incarnate. Uh, share our human life. The first is, since he's made us suffer a lot, for good cause, no doubt, but uh, made us suffer a lot, he ought to suffer with us. Uh, secondly, um, if he suffers, uh, his, his suffering uh, 
uh, could serve as an atonement for sins, and if any of you were present at the lecture I gave I, um, uh, a couple of days ago, I gave some reason for that, but I'm not going to <laughs> develop that now. Um, uh, but um, since we can't make satisfactory atonement for our sins, it's good that atonement should be made by us. And so if uh, God comes to earth and lives a human life, we can then present it to God as the human life we ought to reflect. Um, so, and what is therefore, and also there is a third reason that God might come to earth to show us how to live, to show us what a good life, a good human life consisted in. So, uh, the, the prior probability of the resurrection depends on how probable it is there is a God, how probable, if there is a God, that he would become incarnate for these sort of reasons. So the probability that he would become incarnate, the probability that a God would become incarnate is uh, a quarter. Um, then uh, we consider more detailed historical evidence and uh, you can see, uh, can see uh, it doesn't matter how, how you divide uh, evidence up between E and K, the, the formula holds however you divide it up, so it's just a matter of convenience how you divide it up. Um, but uh, if we put, uh, if we divide the historical evidence into two parts, then um, there is what I call the prior historical evidence, which is the evidence of detailed evidence about the life of Jesus, and there is the posterior evidence, uh, the evidence of what happened after the crucifixion. Um, uh, if you, uh, 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 let's consider all that evidence for the moment as uh, part of E. So the issue is how probable would you have this, the conjunction of the particular evidence we've got, whatever it is, about the life of Jesus before and about what happened afterwards, how probable it is you would have that if uh, uh, Jesus uh, uh, was God incarnate and came uh, uh, and uh, how probable it is if Jesus was incarnate, was resurrected from the dead, you get this evidence and how probable it is you get this evidence anyway. And as uh, uh, I thought you would pronounce your name Callum, and I'm very glad to <laughs> learn from John that it's Callum. It, uh, English people say Callum, Americans say Callum, but I don't mind. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in that case, Callum. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, uh, so much depends on the exact values of it here. Now, I argue this is quarter, I argue that. Uh, uh, the probability of this value is 1 out of 10. Uh, I've forgotten exactly what I gave this value to, but the, the, the rather similar value is the probability of E on not R, not R and K, and that I gave the value of 1 uh, over 1,000. That is the probability that if Jesus didn't rise, um, uh, you would get the evidence you did. Uh, we can take this for present purposes as equivalent to that. It's not quite the same, but equivalent purposes. And if you give the fact, the value, the prior quarter, if you give that at a tenth, and if you give this at uh, one out of a um, thousand, uh, you can see that this rise is very high. In fact, uh, uh, you can see that this fat base factor as it's called, it is therefore going to be 100. And uh, <laughs> I've got my sums wrong somewhere, haven't I? I couldn't possibly do that. Um, uh, 100 times a quarter is not going to give you this. Where have I gone wrong? You're thinking of it in the odds form. Sorry? You have a strict, uh, a strict base factor and the prior odds, and then you're calculating posterior odds from that. So it's a 3 to 1. Or one to three against, if it's a quarter on that side, and then you've got 100 to one in favor with the likelihood ratio. And so then you're coming up with a, a three to 100 uh, compound, compound. Yeah, it's, it's uh, this so uh, it's a misrepresentation. Right, you, run, you run to about 100 over 103, which comes out to the point. Yes, seven. yes, thank you very much. The calculations are all in there. Uh, <laughs> my ability to run them off 
uh, impromptu is clearly lacking. Uh, right, thank you for telling me what my values are. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, if this, this is a water, this, this comes out at uh, something like uh, uh, nearly four, that is to say, uh, nearly four tubs of water, so that comes out as, as nearly one. Um, now, uh, what I meant to talk about this morning, but I have gone through, through that because a lot of people uh, uh, aren't necessarily very familiar with this. Uh, um, Tim and Lydia McGrew have also worked on these issues, but they have uh, just worked on what this ratio would be. Um, and uh, they have suggested that it is very, very high, and so there really isn't no, any need to take account of that. Uh, correct me where I'm wrong about you. Okay. Uh, we wouldn't say there isn't any need to take account of that. We just say that this is very, very high. Yeah. Of course, one, one and, needs uh, to say more. Right. Yeah. The figure given uh, is 10 to the 43. Uh, for for your, a, a related ratio, the, the likelihood yes. ratio. Uh, this is the article by Tim and Lydia McGrew in the Oxford Hat. <laughs> oh, I've got the wrong volume, maybe. Uh, the Blackwell <laughs> Companion to Natural Theology. Uh, sorry, it looks like that when I brought it off my shelf. Um, yes, uh, and um, that uh, seems to me uh, very high. Um, if it was as high as that, then, I mean, you wouldn't need... Uh, the existence of God would have to be almost impossible uh, for us to reach a conclusion that the resurrection didn't happen. And I don't think that. I don't think we have reasonable justification for believing the resurrection did happen unless uh, we can get a reasonable value. And of course, my value is a quarter for that. Uh, now, the reasons that Tim and Lydia give for giving such a high value, a high value, remember, to the probability that you would find certain, uh, the sort of evidence we've got about the witnesses to the empty tomb and um, uh, the life of Jesus and so on. Uh, the probability that we would get these evidence uh, if the resurrection occurred as opposed to the probability uh, that we'd get it if the resurrection didn't occur. And uh, they put this value at something like 10 to the 43. Now that's quite an extraordinary value, and uh, Tim and Kim can explain how you get there. But you get there on the basis, uh, according to this article, of three sorts of evidence. Um, uh, one is uh, the, the evidence of uh, the women at the tomb, right? I'm I apologize for seeing the wrong volume. I meant, of course, to quote the dated, but uh, that's what happened. I've been a bit busy lately. Um, w, D, and P, is that right? right? Those are some of the salient facts. That yes, uh, right. that's right. And you give the value a W. Um, I'm sorry, Tim, if you just repeat the, the, val the three values you give to. Uh, to if you're wanting the exact numbers, I don't have them off the top no, of no, my head, no, so no, I don't okay. have that. But the, uh, the, the question is, uh, how likely is it that we would have accounts, which undoubtedly we do have, of the discovery of the empty tomb first by women, yeah. supposing that the resurrection did occur, yeah. as compared, and in this case critically, compared in a ratio, because that's you know, applied to the odds form, with the probability that we would have accounts of the discovery of the tomb by women, supposing that the resurrection had not occurred. Yeah. And, and similarly then, for the conversion of Paul, and for the transformation and testimony of the disciples. Yes. Now, the, uh, the I won't question the value you gave to the, uh, if where E is simply W, but I was very worried about the very high values that you gave to um, the other two factors, uh, parts of your evidence, D and P. Let's start at the end. You put enormous value on the appearance uh, uh, of Jesus to Paul. Um, and um, uh, 
this was, of course, a remarkable event. Uh, Paul seemed to be, as he went on the road to Damascus, to be aware, uh, become aware of a very bright light shining and uh, of, the pre of the physical presence of Jesus who um, uh, and he asked him who he, Paul asked him who he was and he said he was Jesus and um, uh, told him that it was hard to, for him to kick against the pricks. Is that right? Is that the phrase? Yes. And um, uh, that he had chosen Paul for a great work. Uh, now, what worries me about this is that the other people there, um, the people who were accompanying Paul, Paul, uh, did they hear anything? Well, the, there are three ac accounts in Acts, and they differ slightly. Uh, and um, I've noted down the differences. Um, the, uh, on one of the accounts, uh, uh, it said that they didn't hear the voice of uh, anyone speaking to Paul. Um, uh, the other, uh, one of the accounts said they did, one said they didn't, uh, one uh, didn't say anything about it. Uh, and secondly, uh, the light, uh, two of the accounts said that uh, they recognized the light, but um, it, the third didn't say whether they did or not. Now, that seems to me <laughs> to suggest uh, that we cannot really count on serious evidence that uh, those accompanying Paul heard detailed words from somebody speaking to Paul. Um, sure, they saw a bright light, but uh, okay, that doesn't seem to mean very much. Um, um, that's not any particular evidence for anything. Um, so, uh, we only really have <laughs> Paul's word for what he saw. Um, and uh, uh, what's, this is an enormous contrast with the evidence of the disciples uh, uh, who claimed to meet the risen Jesus after his resurrection because although one or two of them were individual uh, appearances, uh, others of them were appearances to groups of disciples who all saw him, and not merely all saw him, but had a significant period of conversation with him um, uh, uh, in which Jesus explained various things, uh, the, 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 the disciples' journey on the road to Emmaus consisted of a long conversation, for example, and there were two of them. Um, and um, uh, so the, uh, now an individual hallucination is not an unknown phenomenon. Uh, people do have individual hallucinations, and I'm sure Paul's is a very striking apparent, uh, appearance. But it, uh, the fact that it seemed that way to Paul, well, it seemed that way to all sorts of people in human history. Uh, but a joint hallucination uh, with a considerable conversation which other people can remember, that really is strong evidence that something really happened. Now, I therefore don't see that you can put much weight on the individual appearance to Paul. It's just not in the cat category of uh, something that can be regarded as a public event which uh, different people saw. I mean, if different people see something, <laughs> the most natural explanation of it is that something is there and it needs a lot of counter evidence to say it isn't. But uh, if one person just sees to say anything, well, that just might be a hallucination. Now you put a great, you think that, uh, that wraps, that adds, uh, I forget what your exact figure you gave to that, but it, uh, to the, the effect of that on the basis fact, on the base factor, but there was the suggestion that uh, in effect that it was most unlikely that this would be a hallucination and the most meant to something like 0 0 uh, 0.001 probability that it was a hallucination. And that seems to me a gross overestimate. 
Now, the other consideration was that uh, under D, uh, the, the second piece of evidence, uh, that all the apostles were prepared to die for their faith. And I think you said there were 13 witnesses, and I take it that the other two, apart from the 11, were Paul and James, the Lord's brother, right? Yeah. Now, that's it. Matthias, actually. I see. Tw uh, it was added to. Yeah, well, why, how do you get 13, then, rather than 14? We had already considered Paul, and so set him aside for the I see, yeah, okay, fine, understood. So, so uh, I mean, part of the evidence about Paul is not just his uh, the appearance, but that he died, yeah. Okay, well, now, how many of the apostles do we really know have died for their faith? Well, we certainly know that the apostle James did, because Acts records that. Um, we do know that, I think we know anyway, that James, the Lord's brother, Died. Uh, uh, the the uh, there is a passage in, in Josephus, the pagan writer. Um, there are two passages in Josephus uh, relative to Christianity. One of them, uh, there is very considerable doubts about its authenticity. Uh, and actually, Richard, sorry, let, let me just stop. It's, there's virtual unanimity now that although there are some editorial interpolations, the substance of the passage in Antiquities 18 is authentic. Okay, well, I'm not going to talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know you want to go on to 20. Yeah, my, my, uh, okay, you know, that you, uh, yeah. The passage uh, which refers to uh, James the Lord's brother being executed by the authorities uh, is usually thought even by, by non-Christian commentators to be a genuine passage. Okay, and we also know, I think, that Peter was um, the tradition in Rome is so strong that he was um, uh, crucified upside down for, the, uh, for his beliefs. Okay, but what about the others? Well, there are, in each case, uh, there is a cult of one of the others who is said <coughs> to have died as a martyr at various places in the Roman Empire and beyond, of course, in the case of Thomas. But uh, these traditions are not uh, very early traditions on the whole. They are, um, we don't have evidence of them, I don't think, though I think Tim knows the, the details better than I, earlier than, than the second century. And um, uh, what we do know is that uh, a lot of uh, cities in the ancient world uh, when Christianity was beginning to become popular, and certainly after it was uh, formally uh, uh, recognized by the Roman authorities, uh, felt that it would be greatly to the advantage of their city to have some connection with Christianity, to have a martyr there and a, a place that people could visit, and um, that would, uh, <laughs> the obvious comment is that would increase the tourist trade. Um, now, uh, that may seem a bit cynical, but just remember two cases. Um, first, uh, the Apostle J James, who, as we have said, was indeed dying for his faith. But what I want to comment on is the cult that, that grew up at, um, um, in Spain at Santiago de Campostela. Um, it first grew up in the, in the form that uh, uh, James visited... Um, uh, Santiago, uh, before he returned and was uh, uh, killed by the Jews. Um, but then it grew up and uh, the uh, Oxford um, uh, Encyclopedia says that the tradition that his corpse was taken there, and it's venerated now of course, uh, was not heard of before the ninth century. Now, my point is, I am not wishing to deny that uh, uh, James died for his faith, but there is this tendency of cities to create cults for martyrs, um, and uh, so one must be suspicious of any claim that uh, a certain one of the apostles was uh, martyred in a, in a certain city. And the, the other obvious example uh, from this country is Glastonbury. Uh, Glastonbury c uh, claims to have been visited by Joseph of Ar Arimathea before his death. Now that clearly didn't happen. <laughs> and uh, there you are, people invent these things. 
Um, now, it may well be that all the apostles died for their faith. I don't want to deny that. But I do want to deny we have any great evidence that they did. Um, maybe some of them didn't. Apart, sorry, apart, of course, from the, uh, you get the your number you from rhymes, John. Rhymes, uh, nobody suggests uh, St. John died um, uh, as a martyr. Um, so there it is for these two reasons. But that, I think, was a very crucial because I remember your numbers, and I apologize again for not having the volume with me. Um, as I remember your numbers, uh, you gave uh, uh, a base factor of 10 to each of these characters, and so that gave you 10 to the, uh, help to make up the 10 to the 43 by providing you with 10 to the 13. And that seems to me a, gr a very considerable exaggeration. Um, I don't have any comment on the value you gave to the women, but I do think that that particular estimate of 10 to the 43, which you reached for this sort of factor, is uh, over the top. But that, given that it isn't over the top, you might nevertheless get a value which is uh, uh, so high uh, in terms of 43, perhaps, but. Uh, 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 Ten to the three or four or something, so that the evidence of natural theology would have to be very low. Um, I don't think, but of course that depends on much more detailed examination of particular cases, I don't think you're going to get that. I think you need a significant input from natural theology, and I think it's there. And that, I think, is, is the difference between us on this. Sorry, I've talked longer than I meant to, so carry on. Thank you very much, Rachel.